Hi, and welcome to the 10 Ideas in 50 Years Lecture Series. Uh, this is a small uh, series of videos with the intent to get across 10 ideas within the past about 50 years that I think are important. Um, we'll get into why I think these are important in perhaps later in the series, uh, but just if, if you had to go back in time 50 years and had only 10 ideas to bring back with you, which ones would you take? Uh, so th this, this series will hopefully give you enough details so that you can at least have those kind of in the back of your head somewhere. Even if you don't understand them on a completely uh, deep level, you'll still have, you know, you'll know about them, you'll know the basics of, uh, of where they're, they're coming from, how to kind of think about them, and, you know, if I can get the idea through, perhaps, you know, an understanding of the idea. But, again, this is not a, a deep, you know, series or course on measure theory or, you know, any really, you know, deep uh, mathematical uh, uh, topic. But we're going to cover some math and we're going to cover some ideas that do get a little bit of, you know, technical. So, uh, if something, you know, starts to kind of glaze over, uh, feel free to email in or comment in or ask some questions. I'm, I will try my best to answer them. If you do uh, find an error uh, or something I've explained incorrectly, uh, please feel free to correct me. Uh, some of these things do get kind of dicey, especially this first video. Uh, it's probably the hardest to get through. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll start. Uh, the first, uh, I guess, idea or paper that I've chosen is one, Choosing a Function at Random, uh, by Robert Amon. Robert Amon is a really smart guy. Uh, most of his uh, research is published on his website. You can go to it. Uh, I'll try to inc include a link to it uh, in wherever this video is posted. But uh, he does a lot of research into game theory, into rationality, uh, into uh, logic, uh, the, the, the kinds of things that you could expect to, to see a paper like this coming from. Um, and so the, the, I guess getting into it, uh, if you want to think about just the, the, the basic idea. So like it, you'll, you'll probably know what a function is and you'll, you'll know, you, you'll have some experience in picking things at random. Like, you'll probably have picked numbers at random. If you've done some programming, you've created a, a, a function that you know, in, initializes a random number generator, pulls a random number, probably uses that to, to pull some random outcome out of the hat. Uh, but in this, uh, I guess, video, we're, we're, we're trying to conceptualize what does it mean to choose a function at random, and, and how could you do it? And so you're going to want to, I, I guess, approach it in, in one of two ways, or at least uh, Robert Amon is, it has suggested that, it, that uh, as far as the 60s were concerned, there was about two ways to do it. Um, and the first way is to approach it in terms of uh, defining the distributions involved. So. We're going to kind of draw a little picture here to hopefully make it a little bit easier to understand. And so, at the end of the day, we want something to go from our domain x's to our range, our y's. And we're going to draw from that a member of a, I guess, Cartesian product set of y to the x. That's just you know, y cross x. And we're going to define ourselves a function. Um, and uh, again, the, the, there's going to be some glossing over some technical details of whether it's legitimate or not to define this function, but we're just going to define it anyway, which is going to go from our x to our y, 
but also from this Cartesian chroma set. And this function is going to be it's just going to pull us this function of x. And so this this function here uh, is going to define us a function based on our domain and range such that given the two inputs the cross or Cartesian product set and our domain that we're going to wind up in a range somewhere and so there's going to be some restrictions that we're going to have to put on uh, specifically this, this y to the x, to ensure that this function is well defined. And there's something called an m structure that this set is going to have to have. And so you may, if you're like me, uh, ask, well, what, what is an m structure? And this is going to be a little bit of a rabbit hole, so uh, hopefully I'll get these terms right. And if not, uh, you know, go to Wikipedia. The, the, the terms will will be a lot clarified, but this this all comes from abstract uh, algebra and measure theory. So, um, if this has to be an M structure, and what that means is it has to be a sigma ring of M sets. Uh, so, now. Again, if you're like me, you'll probably ask, well, what, what is this sigma ring thing? A sigma ring, it has to have, it, it is a space that is defined by some operations that have, that support relative complementation, uh, countable union, and that it has to be a closed space. So the operations that define it have to, to, to be closed. And so there's that side. And then you'll ask, well, what, what is an M set? And so, uh, again, going a little bit further down the rabbit hole, uh, an M set is a sigma algebra uh, that is the, the, I guess, the set of all uh, Borel sets in a space. So. Is our space such that uh, it's defined by the union uh, or set of operations that include the union, countable intersection, and relative complement. So, again, th these are kind of technical details. Uh, they're not totally necessary to, to see that. At the end of the day, you're going to have to define some things to to make this a well-behaved space. If it has to be an M structure, it has to have these properties. And at the end of the day, that is going to depend on this having three properties. By three, I mean two. So, this, the third, of course, being what defines it, this uh, y to the x, uh, I guess, definition for it. Uh, but that has to go ar along with a, and remember, so if it's an M structure, it has to have a, I guess, it, it is a sigma ring of M sets. So it's going to be, have this structure defined on it, uh, and you can view that as a what's called a measure. Excuse me. And a sigma ring. And so we're going to call this measure. Uh, I guess I, uh, I can never remember the the Greek name for this letter. It's like the uh, fancy U. Uh, but so now th this is kind of an important detail. But th the reason that I, I went down this rabbit hole is just to show that in order to define this as an M structure, as, as the kind of structure you need to define this function properly, 
you need two arguments fed into it. And one of them is going to be a measure, which is kind of like a, a structure, a, a way of measuring a, a, a space. And then the other is going to be this sigma ring on top of it. And so this is going to be treated as a random variable. And we're going to need its distribution in order to treat it that way. And the in order for it to have a distribution, uh, there is a restriction on this function in that the so, so what, what does it mean to be a distribution? Okay, well, at the end of the day, our range is going to be divided into, like what, what we mean when we say distribution is that it's going to assign a probability, or it's, or it's going to, to split its range into possible spaces, or, or possible ranges, that the, this function can wind up pointing to, or, or wind up providing to. So, so if we're thinking about a, a, you know, a, a possible function that we could pull out of our hat, uh, let, let's say the, the function y equals x squared, uh, or f of x is equal to f x squared, a possible outcome in our range is going to be uh, positive numbers. And then there could be negative numbers, and then there could be things that are not positive and negative. And there's going to be a probability uh, given any function of both getting positive, negative, or other. Uh, and so it turns out that you can actually define this probability based on two things. And the first of these two things is this measure. And the second of those two things is the measure on the other part of the input to this function. Now, kind of reviewing what this function is, is it pulls from the domain and this set of do domains tied with ranges. And again, the reason why we want to do that is we want to pull a, a function out. We don't just want to pull the x out, we want to pull the x and the f. We want to pull the point along the path that we're, we're defining, as well as the path itself. So if we're choosing a, a random path and position along that path, we're, we're, we're choosing this, we're, we're defining this path and position in such a way that, that we're, I guess, choosing it randomly and without prejudice. Uh, and so if we have this function here, this, I, I think it's phi, uh, we can know that the probability of f being in this b at the end of the day is going to be defined as the cross product of the, the two measures multiplied by the inverse of this function. So that, that makes some intuitive sense, once you've kind of wrapped your head around it a little bit, in that you start with your end result, you get there by applying this function. So this function has to have an inverse in order for this to be true. And so already we're, we're adding requirements on this function. So first of all, this space has to have these two properties, this measure and this sigma ring on top. 
and we'll get into a little bit more of where uh, where, where you, you can pull these properties from, but at the moment just kind of take it for granted that these are two things that are outside of the system that you're, that you're thinking about. You, these are things that you'll, you'll define as kind of input to your, when, when you define a function of random, you need to define these two things in order to define it. And so if you want to end up in this subset of your possible range, B, you apply the inverse to get wherever you started from in both your range or domain and this set of, I guess, possible uh, x's and possible f of x's. Multiplied again by the measure, basically so that the, uh, the uh, it, it balances out. So, if this is the case, if this has to be a distribution and this has to turn out to be true, then that imposes another restriction on our function. In that this function, in order for those two things to be true, this function has to be what's called an M transformation. Now again, you know, if, if, if this was me watching this video, I would be asking, well, what's an M transformation? Uh, an M transformation uh, obeys, it is a transformation. That obeys a specific property. It's going to obey the property that from some domain and sigma ring to some range and presumably some other space for every b and b, the inverse of that function is a member of this ring. So again, this is just kind of accounting uh, so that you can know certain things about this function, including that there is a distribution, uh, or, or rather that it has a distribution. And so th this is a requirement for it to have a distribution. Now, is it th that important to know? You know, that, that particular definition, probably not, you can always look it up. But just to know that there is a restriction on this. So, so we're, we're not just choosing any function to define these functions around them. We, 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 we've come up with this, this tool, but, it, but it, it, it's kind of bogged down by these requirements that we have to have these two uh, variables that we put into it. It has to be restricted in that it, has to be an M transformation, and so this this is kind of a problem. And if that wasn't enough, it's unclear, uh, or at least it was unclear, until this uh, I think 1963 paper, uh, how exactly you would define this measure and this. This, uh, this ring, uh, this sigma ring, uh, in a meaningful way that 
that encapsulates all possible domain and range pairs, i.e. the Cartesian product of domain and ranges. It, it's, it's too big of a space. Like the, the, the set of all domains uh, is it, going to be pretty, pretty large. It, it's a very general space as is. But since we're taking two very general spaces, um, it wasn't clear how you could could create a, a way of structuring that, that, that Cartesian product space so that you could pull from it in a meaningful way. That That is a problem. And so it, it, if we can kind of re remember, we we were able to, to make this all work, and this is kind of the, the first important point, that if we can define this function that pulls from the domain and the, this Cartesian product space, uh, we, we can come up with this function at random, but it has to have a distribution in order for us to treat it as a random value. And so, that, that's kind of the, the first important thing, but if we can't meaningful pull, or meaningfully pull from this space, then it's unclear how the rest of it will work. Uh, or, or at least you're, you're not really going to be able to do much about... Um, you, you won't be able to define this, and so even if you can get that far, uh, you won't get any further. So. And the so so this is kind of a, a troublesome space. And even if this x space and this y space are equal to what's called i, and just as a sort of basic definition, I is defined, at least in this field, as the, I guess, closed um, segment between 0 and 1 on the real number line, along with uh, a Borel, what, what's called a Borel structure. And we can get into the Borel structure. I think I did a, another video on defining what a Borel structure is. Uh, but, so, you can view it as just the real line between 0 and 1, along with the structure, some basic structure. And so even if our domain and range are, are just defined between 0 and 1 on this i interval uh, with the Borel structure, it's still not enough. And this space is still too complicated to pull from meaningfully. Uh, and there, there, there was at the time no way to define a structure on that space or a measure on that space that would allow you to pull this trick. Now, there is an exception in that if you had some subspace of the Cartesian product, F, you could make this work. Uh, if F only has one member, like, let's say f has a single point, which is the function f of x equals x squared. You know, that this then is a combination of domain and range, x and x squared, but it's only one combination. So if the, the entire size of this set is one, then you can define a function that pulls from this set randomly, because there's only one to pull from, such that you wind up with a defined probability in your range for any domain that you can define for that function. So if f is one element, it's possible. If f is defined in a general way so that it is all possible functions, it's too big. And so there's this kind of paradox in that We've got uh, this this space that is not very well defined, but we know that in if it's small enough, it can work with this function, and if it's big enough, it can't. And so the question is, and, and this is what I've been kind of building towards, 
is how big can this F be? That is the meat of the question. That, that is what we're trying to get at, is what, how can we define F so that you can produce a randomly pulled out function that assigns functions with domains and ranges. Now, it turns out, in kind of an unrelated way, uh, that F can be a subset of any finite bare class. And again, here's another term that's probably coming out of nowhere to a lot of people. But a bare class is a uh, set of possible functions uh, with the basic idea that uh, bear class 1 is the set of continuous functions. And so your sine waves, your polynomial functions, uh, most of anything you'll, you'll learn in high school or maybe early calculus will be in here, uh, but certain things are not. Uh, discrete uh, or discontinuous uh, functions, uh, anything with uh, kind of a hard edge uh, is probably going to be not in bear class 1. So they would be potentially in bear class 2, which is the, I guess, sum of uh, a, the a, a bare class 1 function and the, I guess, pointwise, um, I guess, infinite sum of pointwise uh, can, how did that work? It, basically, it's the, the sum of continuous functions plus functions of, of bare class 1. And it's going to look like So we have the, the in, or potentially infinite sum of continuous functions and functions of bare class 1. So you're, you're basically gaining a measure of complexity for every le level of bare class you go, uh, such that there are going to be functions that you can define in some bare class n that are not definable in anything less than n. So, going back to our big picture, we have this, this subspace or, or subset F of our Cartesian product of domain and ranges that can turn out to be a member of a, any finite bare class. But this, if we go back, when, when we initially kind of set out, we wanted a, a, a function and a point that is going into that function, so, so part of its, its domain defined. So we want to find a path and a point along that path at random. And in order to do that, we have to come up with a subset of the Cartesian product of domain and range. This uh, sigma ring and this measure on that sigma ring. Now, at that point, you know, we, we could kind of leave it and we could say, okay, well, that's how you define a function at random. That's all there is to it. You need these three things. But it turned out that there's also a second way to do it. 
second way involves not defining that function that you treat as a random number, but instead defining a probability space. which you need to define three things to define this space. And the fact that it's three things shouldn't be altogether surprising in, because if you remember from our first method of defining this random function, or defining a function at random, that you needed to do three things. You needed to define that f, you needed to define the measure, and you needed to define that sigma ring. And our goal is going to continue to be to define a, 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 a the probabilities for our range or to define a, 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 a distribution on our range but we're not going to do it with a function because then it would have to be a, a, a it would have to in order for this to be a, uh, part of a distribution that function would have to be an M transformation and that's an unnecessary restriction. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to define this function, this zero dot uh, function. And now remember that this is a really large general set or, or space, this y to the x. And so if we're going from some probability space, which can be pretty generally defined, and this y to the x, uh, then this, it turns out, doesn't have to be an M transformation, because these two are two way too general spaces in order to do, in order uh, for that to be true. And it turns out that there's a, a, a trick that you can use to, to get to here, which is that you define a, a cross product of your probability space, which is going to be a little bit more constrained than um, your possible ranges, and your domain. And you're going to define a second function and that's going to go from the cross product of this probability space to y, your range, and it's going to be defined as A random function to or fed with the input of your initial range. So now remember our, our initial domain, our x, is going to come with a, a measure on it. You know, you're, you're feeding in this, this properly defined uh, value with this properly defined structure. So it's going to have this B measure on it. And we're, our probability space gets a measure as well. Uh, so we've defined this probability space as a measure. And so we can know that the probability of a function being in this 
this B in this range is, is going to be similarly defined, because this can be an M transformation. As long as this is an M transformation, this turns out to, to be definable as an M transformation, because this is okay to be a distribution. We're, we're keeping these two kind of separate. And so the probability of a function being in here, kind of running out of space here, but... is similarly defined as the inverse of this function applied to this range or this subset of possible ranges multiplied by the cross product of the measure of x and our probability space. So that should look familiar from the last structure because we're all we're doing is we're just defining a distribution. And so this equation def basically defines it for us and de gives us a property, gives us a meaning when we say you know, this has a distribution, what does that mean? It means that there is a probability that you'll end up in this part of your range. So reviewing, this is an M transformation, this is not. But it turns out that you can define these two such that there is an isomorphism between them. Now again, this, this is not a, a course on measure theory or, or you know, the, the really, really deep aspects of math. And if you were you know, taking a course in this entire area, or area, you would probably want to see this proved. Um, there is a proof in Robert Amon's paper. It's a little complex. I don't see that you need to really understand it to just get the concept that you start with a probability space. Your goal is to define a function at random to wind up in this space. You're going to need to pull from this pairings of uh, domains and ranges or domain subset and range subset pairs. And that it turns out that there's this isomorphism between these two functions that you can define. I guess that you'll, you'll have to accept that on, on, on the, the face of it, but uh, since there is this isomorphism, uh, then a couple of interesting things apply. Well, first of all, it gives us a, a way of defining this, in that your, because you get to choose your probability space, you can set this probability space up such that this is true, and so that you can get to this, this end goal, this distribution, and all you need to do is pick the right space. Now, now here's where I'm, I, I'm going to kind of get to where all this is going. Why, why do we care about these two different ways of kind of uh, these two different mechanisms for defining spaces? And the findings of the paper and the, 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 the end goal is the fact that for all possible subsets of this Cartesian product space F, there exists a probability space. So again, I'm not going to prove that to you, but there is our idea. The, the idea that, you, that I want to get across to you, if you remember, if you find some way of, of getting to this idea and storing it without storing all the rest of the details, there is what's worth remembering that this probability space that you can define 
for all possible combinations of domain and ranges, i.e. for all possible spaces that you can define functions on, there is a probability space such that the range of this function is f, i.e. the range of this function is f. And again, we, I think there's a kind of a caveat on that in that it, it, it actually gives you more than that. Uh, or, or at least the way that they've set things up in the paper that you get more than that. But that's all that, that's kind of important to these two ways of defining functions at random. Now the second thing, so the, here. The second thing is if we remember our, our original y to the x had to have three things defined. So first of all, you needed this f. And so now we have a way of getting f because we can define a probability space a lot easier than defining this f um, e even without knowing about the, the, the possible uh, values of f in that they can be finite um, subset, sub finite subsets of bare spaces or, or bare classes. Uh, even if you didn't know that, you'd have some way of defining f because you'd be able to define it from a probability space. The second thing worth remembering or worth knowing about here is that you can define the measure based on this function here. Now remember, this function can be a pretty broad function. It doesn't have to be an M transformation. It, it is some kind of a... a, a transition from a probability space to our y to the power of x space, this really, really general space. So this, this is some kind of, of, of transition. But again, it can be a very hazily defined thing. And that's going to allow us to do some very powerful things. Uh, but again, the, the point here is that you can define u to the g, or whatever you call that character. By the inverse function of this. So this has to be an invertible function for this to work. But again, that can be a pretty uh, generic requirement. So again, the inverse of that function on sub g, multiplied by the measure of our probability space. So again, we're, we're defining a measure on a space that's easy to define a measure on. The, a, a, a space that has a probability defined on it, um, you're, you're going to be able to, to produce a measure a lot easier than this really, really general, broad, ambiguous space. And it turns out that g is a subset of f. And the third thing to note is that there's another isomorphism in that, or, or rather, the, the third thing worth noting is that, so that, again, the, kind of to summarize, in case we're getting lost here, the first thing to note that's important is that this f this subset of the possible domain and range pairs is definable by the probability space. The second thing is that the u, this, this measure on this space, is definable by 
the inverse of that function definable on the probability space. The third thing to note is that if this function is defined to be isomorphic with a third function called, I guess, pipe, I or whatever the pronunciation is of it, which is a kind of self-pointing at set or self-pointing at relationship from some set x to set x or from set from the domain set x to the domain set x, then it turns out that this third property, this sigma ring, is defined in such a way that um, it, is al it is allowed to be defined on a set this large. Similarly, if this function, this dot function that goes from our probability space to our really generically defined Cartesian product space, then again, it is allowed to define the, 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 the sigma ring on it. So again, the, the four things worth remembering from this, it, it, assuming I presented this all correctly, is one, these, these two ways of looking at defining a function at random. The first one is based on a, a function 